good morning and welcome. Uh, we are here today uh, with uh, uh, Professor Irv Miller to continue our series of discussions with the founding faculty. Uh, we're interested in trying to uh, capture some of uh, the knowledge, the insight, some of the experiences uh, that were uh, formulative for uh, our department and for the field of biomedical engineering. Great. So I'd like to welcome you here today, Irv, and, well, and I, just to sort of get the ball rolling, I am curious about uh, uh, your uh, early uh, connections with uh, UIC, you know, why you came here, what okay. you thought you were getting into, who, who brought you. Okay. Uh, so if you could sort of uh, tell us about that. Sure, we be happy go to. Go from there. Um, I got my degrees in, from the University of Michigan in chemical engineering, and my area was primarily in combustion of all things. Hmm. And after two years in industry, I went to, I started teaching at Brooklyn Polytech, which at that time was a private school, but is now part of NYU. And in 1965, uh, a major event happened in, at NIH, which I had no, pre no knowledge about, and that is an NIH uh, set up a study section on bioengineering, and they tried to figure out how to, to get bioengineering off the ground. I mean, the, I, you know, the motivation came from all the stuff that happened during the Second World War, all the, right. all the stuff involved, you know, with, you know signal transmission, all yeah, that sort of stuff. And this is 50 years before the Institute of Correct. Biomedical Imaging and way Bioengineering before, was founded. Way before, way yeah, before. Yeah. But, but people got the idea that bioengineering is an emerging field and NIH ought to have a hand in developing it. So they set up a study section of 10, of 10 people and uh, of that 10, there were three names that are key to my coming here. Uh, the first one was John Truxell, who was the chairman of that, co of that committee, and he was dean of engineering at Brooklyn Poly. Hmm. Second one was George Bugliarello, who was the head of, uh, I guess, civil engineering and bioengineering at Carnegie Mellon. And then the third one was Larry Stark, who was uh, essentially the founder of the bioengineering department here. Wow. Did George later come here as dean? Yes, he did. Oh and I'm, I'm coming to that. <laughs> I'm coming to that. A, f a, yeah, a few years after that, again before I knew what was going on, uh, George Bugliarello was hired as Dean of Engineering at UIC. Wow. And uh, uh, about, uh, th this would have been, I guess some, uh, some anyway, th no, this was later, but, but the thing is in 1965, what happened, I had just been promoted, I was a chemical engineer and doing combustion stuff, and I was getting tired of, uh, rocket work, and I, I figured I ought to be able to do something that would be a more immediate benefit for people rather than well, machines. This is the, the, the classic transition of the engineer to the bioengineer. Amen. We, we all, mo all of us who were in these chairs made Amen. that. Amen. So I, what I had done is I, I started getting involved in, in a few other things. Since chemical engineers in that time, uh, water desalination was a big thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I got involved in water desalination, and it's just a short step from water desalination to artificial kidneys. Okay. <laughs> because that's what artificial sure, that's what kidneys sure. do. Right, right, right. Anyway, in 1965, a little thereafter, uh, the, training, uh, the NIH issued this, basically this program of training grants. Right. And every member of that committee got a training grant. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the way it was done in those days. Yes, yes, yes. President uh, at the creation. President at the creation. So Larry Stark got a training grant uh, here. Right. Uh, George Bullarello got one at Carnegie, and John Truxell got one at Brooklyn Poly. John Truxell was a very creative guy, but he didn't really like to manage stuff. Hmm. And I had just gotten promoted. It was now I was doing artificial kidney work, and it was now sixty-five. I just become an associate professor, and one day John buttonholes me and he says, "How would you like to manage a training grant?" I said, "Sure, I can do anything." Okay, <laughs> sure. So uh, all of a sudden, I was head of the bioengineering program at Brooklyn Poly. I just happened. I, I, I mean, that's just the way it happened. I had right. I had no previous connection with it, but but it got interesting. And uh, I went ahead and, uh, it's, it's, you know, I, I, wrote a, I wrote a doctoral program and got it approved, wrote a master's program, and basically we started building the program. So the training grant allowed this transition to occur it from did. a research area into an academic? Correct, correct, correct. Exactly. That's exactly what happened. <clears throat> and uh, a few years after that, after I was involved with that, George Bugliarello came to UIC as, as Dean of Engineering. I did not know that. Yes. I knew he came as Dean, but I didn't realize he had a bio background. He had a bio background. Wow. Um, 
And uh, I don't remember what year it was, because I was not here at the time, but Larry Stark left. Yeah, I think 68, I think. Whenever it was. Right. Um, and at some point during that period, the Old Boys Network kicked in, and George Bugliarello called John Truxell, and he says, do you know anybody who would like to come <laughs> to Chicago to be head of bioengineering? <laughs> yeah. And John said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and in 1973, January, I, I, appeared, I appeared at UIC. And it was, that, I mean, it was that simple. I was, you know, New York's a tough place to live, and particularly to bring up little kids. And we, we had the first and second grader at the time. Okay. And the one day the phone rings, and uh, J Jim Hartnett, who was chair of the search committee, called me, and he says, we'd like, to, we'd like you to take a look at BioE in Chicago. So I did. Okay. The thing that was sort of interesting about that, when I came, he had this blueprint of what was going to be the new bioengineering building. And it was going to be, oh, it was, no, I beg your pardon, it was, was going to be the new engineering research building, which right. was going to be uh, just west of SES, You're on that big parking lot, which is still there. Right outside yes. the building here. And he, the blueprints were all drawn. And he says, this is going to be the bioengineering wing. It's going to be right here. Do you have a copy of those blueprints in your files? No. I'd love to show <laughs> no. them to somebody. What ha of course, <laughs> to make a long story short, the money never materialized for that building. Right. But I, so I came here in January of 73, and at that time, there were four members of the department. They were? They were Bert Zuber, Earl Gose, John Semlo, and myself. And we were the bioengineering program. In that time, the College of Engineering was organized, not in traditional departments, but in some kind of a, I don't know what you'd call a matrix structure. There was an energy engineering department, and there was materials engineering department, and there was a systems engineering department, and the fourth one, I forget, it could have been... Information? Information. Yeah. Information engineering, yeah. right. Yeah. And then the bioengineering was a program. Those were all very forward-looking modern names. I mean, today, if you were Correct. starting a college, you might pick them right. as being timely and uh, right. appropriate. Well, it was kind of interesting because when I came, I came with an appointment in physiology and an appointment in, in engineering. And it was kind of interesting because that year, it was very actually quite funny. Um, the president of the university was, uh, what was his name? Uh, John Corbally was president Corbally, of the university. Yeah, I remember that name. And you know, every year he had a theme that would go to legislature to get money. Smart man. And his theme <coughs> that year was the organic university. The university as a whole, a, a huge orga organ. Right, organ. Right. Um, the vice president of the university at that time, again, I'm blocking on his name. Uh, he became chancellor at, uh, uh, in the uh, California state system at some point. Uh, Barry Munitz. Hmm. Barry Munitz was vice president. And uh, he, he actually lived in Evanston. And I remember we went to a cocktail party, and he introduced me around and says, I'd like you to meet the organic university. <laughs> <laughs> I was the only one in the university that had, a, that had an appointment on more than one campus. <laughs> so I was kind of strange. But uh, anyway, we, uh, the first thing that happened when I came here in 73 was uh, they had gotten permission to submit a proposal for a doctoral program in bioengineering. To the IBHE, probably. To the IBHE. Right. And uh, George Bugliarello uh, said, okay, you're here, write, write the proposal. So I, I showed up on day one. On day two, I was writing a proposal for a PhD program. Okay. Happily, I had already done one for right, Brooklyn Valley. Right, right, right. So, so you it was a good uh, man for the job. It was very easy to do. Right. And we got it approved. And at that point, that's when we started uh, recruiting doctoral students in bioengineering here. And then the department officially was created at a later time when the uh, college it, was reorganized correct. into traditional disciplines? Correct, correct. I mean, I, I, mean I, I was basically treated as a department head, even though there was no department. But, you know, I would meet with the department heads, as, as, and there were five of us there. Was there any r relationship with the sister campus in Urbana at that time? No. Or? No, our relationship <coughs> was with the medical center and medical with Rush. Center. And with Rush, because at that time in the early days, Rush was actually a teaching hospital for U of I. It was only later that Rush split off on its own. So, uh, and actually, the uh, the antagonism between Rush and the U of I medical center was actually in in place even when I came. I did I had no knowledge of that, of course. Interesting. Um, but even after they split off, uh, we maintained research ties to both Rush and U of I. We had a, we had a number of faculty that had appointments at uh, at Rush. Uh, actually, Larry Stark had an appointment at Rush at, at this, at originally, I think, and and a lot of the others did as well. So, what kind of work 
were you doing in bioengineering at UIC? Uh, I was doing primarily imp implants work. I, I did some work on artificial kidneys and uh, heart-lung machines, heart-lung bypass. Mm -hmm. uh, my main interest was in membrane transport, one sort or another. So okay. I, did a, I did a fair amount of work in, uh, you know, basically so, membrane transport. So you were building on your chemical engineering Correct. expertise. Correct. And, 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 you know, sort of the traditional biomedical engineering where you apply an engineering technology to a right. medical problem. And Correct. Correct. So I was interested in, in what, ha what would happen when, when we uh, you implanted particular kinds of uh, materials in the body and how the body would, would, would yeah, you, yeah. Wh why is something right. compatible? Right, as an engineer, why unless you're in the Navy, you don't dip things in salt water. Right, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So I was doing a lot of that, and at, uh, at one point, I took that te technology a bit further, and we developed a, a synthetic blood replacement, um, which actually worked pretty well in dogs. We actually uh, wound up... Uh, replacing about a third of, the, of a dog's blood with actually no ill effects whatsoever, which was kind of interesting. Okay, so the main... It worked. It worked as far I as we could tell. The engineering role of blood is to deliver oxygen, remove CO2, and hemoglobin does that. And if you Correct. Can, and Correct. package it the hemoglobin... You Correct. We microencapsulated the hemoglobin, right. and we used lipids, to, so there were no, there were, there was, it was biocompatible. Interesting. And we patented it, and uh, we what licensed the patent to Baxter. Was... was wasn't American Hospital Supply there before Baxter? Correct. Mer what happened is that American Hospital Supply either bought Baxter or the other way around. American Hospital Supply was bigger. Right. But, uh, and, you know, in the early days, Baxter was really a very uh, was a high tech company with a lot done a lot of research, a lot of the r early work in in uh, rep you know artificial kidneys and so forth, and you know rep you know basically you know disposable kidneys and all that stuff. That that all come it came out of Baxter, Baxter. in the early days. Uh, but then what happened was that uh, they merged with American Hospital Supply, and rather, and I think what happened is that the research base for uh, Baxter sort of got submerged in the basically the production of solutions, disposables, and disposables and stuff. Right. Stuff. Yeah. Um, so uh, I mean, Baxter International is now a very big company, but it's really uh, I'm not sure who who swallowed who. Right. Yeah. Well, was Abbott at all a player back then? Mm, not much. Not much. Uh, there may have been a few of our people that had some contacts with ba Abbott, but not not much. It was mostly, um, you know, through Rush and so right. forth. So it's interesting because we like to think that today this push on faculty to develop uh, translatable technology, bench to bedside, thinking of a problem in the clinic, thinking of an engineering solution, trying to enable it through a technology that can be uh, manufactured and mm -hmm. then uh, uh, outsourced and produced. Yeah. We, the, so this isn't a new thing. This has oh, no, no. been around, it's been around since forever. day one in bioengineering, at least, or biomedical yeah. engineering. It's my belief that bioengineering uh, developed when the first caveman picked up a stick because he hurt his ankle and made a crutch out of it. And that's when bioengineering started. <laughs> that's that's a good start. Yeah, I, I I didn't think of it going back quite that far. <laughs> Maybe going back to the Greeks or something, but uh, goes back further than that. Goes back. <laughs> Interesting. So what what you you were trained as an engineer? I think as most of us as our generation Correct. were, because there wasn't any 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 discipline to even aspire toward. Right. But what it, was it about your early education that got you into this quantitative measuring, modeling, manipulating? I was always a, a puzzle solver. I love puzzles. Like crossword puzzle or like, like crossword you, puzzles, things that you like, like any kind of puzzles. I just, I like puzzles. And I was always interested in fixing stuff. Right, right. And I Usually taking, I, in my case, taking things apart and then finding I couldn't fix right, them. But right, but 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 and I was always interested in fixing stuff that were that was useful to somebody. And uh, you know, I, and that's yeah. you know, I I would always fiddle with stuff, and uh, well, that's that, yeah. that's why I became an engineer. Well, that's yeah, that's I, I worry today with everything being encapsulated in a in a hermetically sealed, you know, non tamper proof package that that we've lost some of these opportunities for children uh, to uh, to interact with with technology and, and 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 without that interaction at a young age the little gears that you see go around in a device are connected to things in your brain are. that are that are being rewired and if you don't get those connections made technology is just a, a magical that's right well, I, I remember as a kid, I took apart my father's alarm clock 
and couldn't quite put it back together again. And uh, he, had, he, he was very annoyed about that. <laughs> But, and, but that's the kind of stuff that, that yep, you know, k yep. kids ought to be able to do. My wife tells a story about her father that they had, you know, six or eight things in their kitchen, in their basement, in their car, that as far as she knew, they always had the same toaster, the, the, mm -hmm. the same carburetor, and whenever it was a problem, her father just took it apart and fixed it. Yeah. That, that yeah. everything was disassemblable. And, Absolutely. And th there was a spring or a resistor or... Uh, a, a gasket yep. or a seal, and, yep. and yeah. there was a screwdriver, and you could take it apart. That's right. And, and when you fixed it, it, it continued to work, and yeah. as opposed to throwing it away and buying another one. That's right. Well, I, I think the disposable society that we've developed is uh, unfortunate in terms of uh, it doesn't allow kids to develop the kind of inquisitiveness that uh, I think they need. Yeah, it doesn't speak or bode well for the future of engineering. If, if, if our training came out of these experiences, Mm -hmm. And to the extent that children right. might not have as much of as many opportunities to right. do that, which is a shame because if I look at these uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Lego Mindstorms, these uh, uh, computer interface things, uh, Raspberry Pi, there are all kinds of spectacular opportunities sure. to do it, but uh, very few young people are following. Yeah. yeah, well, you know what happens if you, um, if you use a crutch all the time, you'll never develop your legs. Can happen, yeah. can happen. Yeah. So speaking of developing, how uh, did you see BioE develop here? Because you, you, you developed, you became the head of the department, but then mm -hmm. you moved on to, right. I, I believe, to be a, a vice uh, well, chancellor? Or? In 1979, I was appointed Dean of the Graduate College and Associate Vice Chancellor for Research, which made me the Chief Research Officer for UIC. Well, they, you didn't mind having multiple jobs, because those are two yeah. completely different positions today with there were one position full-time jobs, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I wore, I wore two hats. In fact, it's kind of funny, well, I'll tell you later on, but, yeah. uh, but, but at one point, when I, was head, I came back as head of bioengineering, I was also head of chemical engineering at the same time. My wife got me uh, two hats, one that said bioengineering, the other said chemical engineering. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that, so I was, uh, at that point, yeah, I was dean, dean and associate of exchange for research, and that, that went from 79 to 85. Okay. Now, in 82, uh, UIC, UICC, the Chicago Circle Campus, merged with the medical center to form UIC. 82 or? It, it, no, it, or it, 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 the, the document was approved in 82. Okay. It didn't actually happen. Okay. It, it was phased in over a okay. period of time. Okay. Yeah. And in 1985, uh, what happened was that the, uh, the, graduate co the graduate colleges and the vice chancellor research office were merged, and Jim Stuckel right. came in as vice chancellor for research. At that time, Don Langenberg was the chancellor. Mm hmm and about a year or two later, Langenberg left, and Stuckel became chancellor. Chancellor. Yeah. And then he went on to be president, I think, of the university, didn't he? Or? Langenberg? No, no, Stuckel. Uh, I don't remember. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. what happened, so in 1985, I, uh, I, I left the, uh, the dean's office and vice chancellor's office, and I moved over to the College of Pharmacy for a year. Another hat. Another hat. And I became professor of pharmaceutics. And then a year, year after that, I uh, came back to the College of Engineering as uh, head of chemical engineering. Interesting. And, that's and that, that would have been, so that would have been around 86, 87, somewhere in there. And I was head of chemical engineering. And then in 92, uh, there was a vacancy in the head of bioengineering at that time. And, uh, they were taught, and the dean, this is Paul Chung, mm -hmm. asked me if I'd be willing to, to wear both hats. Uh, I was head of BioE and head of Chem E, and I said sure. And that, that lasted until 95 when I left the university. Right, because I came, I think, in 98, 99. Right. And, and there'd been sort of a, a, an, <clears throat> an intervening period where BioE was a degree granting program, but not, right. no longer a department. Correct. And Correct. that has pluses and minuses. And I was in Urbana at the time as a program director. and. I mean, you have no official faculty, you have no official, you have a small budget, you have no official space, you have no official duties, but yeah. you're expected to do things. But it's interesting, you know, there are pluses and minuses to that kind of organization. For one thing, you have flexibility. Right. Uh, and if you get people who are interested in what you're doing and you can sell them on it, 
you can basically get their uh, get their time without having to pay them. And that's there are certain advantages to that. And then you you don't have the overhead of of having to manage the program, the recruitment, the staff, right. the space, Correct. the and curriculum. And you don't have to deal with them at race time or anything like that. Yeah, right. good point. So uh, so there are, you know yeah I mean the, the 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 minuses of course is that you don't have dedicated space and dedicated people. I mean you can't basically right you you can't you can never put down on a piece of paper what you have yeah. <laughs> because it keeps shifting. Right, and I think a lot of the stakeholders like to see an edifice that goes with that department or that program. Correct. And to the extent that you have an institute or a building, you know, as, as bioengineering at one time did, <laughs> yes. uh, you know, th th then you could say success has been uh, achieved. Right. right. Uh, Whereas some of these programs that are a little more interdepartmental, which mm -hmm. or interdisciplinary, which are all good things in their mm -hmm. flexibility, uh, sometimes suffer at budget time when sure. things are divvied up on a basis of research grants per member. Yeah, but one thing that was a big advantage to being a program was finding spot slots for doctoral students who do interesting research. Because we were able to, to put students in all kinds of interesting places. I mean, at Oregon and at uh, Rush and at uh, various places, uh, Abbott and other places, uh, primarily because, uh, they, and, and get them funded outwhere because, because, you know, because these people did not, have, did not wear a, a label that said, I am in the bioengineering department. Interesting, yeah. interesting. So, and that seemed to work pretty well. So you could bring a student in, sort of more or less a chemical engineer, get them a job at Abbott, and yeah, yeah, get yeah. their degree under yeah. bioengineering, yeah. And so they could. I mean, which I, I, yeah, yeah, and, and a large f number I mean, of our students fit that category. Oh yes, I think the, you know, in a traditional discipline, mechanical engineering or physics, you. You, you sort of see the track or tracks that you yeah. are going to follow, but right. in right. these uh, cross-disciplinary right. areas, it's, it's not so clear. And, and, and even in, in my case, in your case, we, we go between the rails. I mean, yes. you're in pharmaceutical engineering, you're in yes. chemical engineering, you're, yeah. you're in bioengineering, depending upon uh, the projects, the interests, yeah. the times, and the opportunities. Right. I actually didn't tell you one other hat I wore. There was a year when I was also head of systems engineering. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's when they, were, when they were looking for a new head and they needed somebody to fill in so that they had that job, too. <laughs> yeah, well you, it was fun. <laughs> oh, interesting. So you have spent... Uh, quite a bit of time in your career here at UIC and at other institutions. And uh, you, therefore, I would surmise have some perspective on where we've come from and maybe where we're going. Sure. Uh, could you share some of those? Sure, I'd be happy to. Observations? Um, this school has undergone a very interesting evolution. I mean, you know, we started out uh, at Navy Pier in 1948. This is when the... Uh, it's part of U of I. Part really. of U of I. The yeah. soldiers all came back uh, from Second World War and the mm -hmm. GI Bill of Rights and so forth, and they all wanted to go back to school. And Urbana was basically uh, drowning in students, essentially. They didn't have space for them. And most of the people lived in Chicago, so they opened this ca campus on Navy Pier, uh, which is now, of course, the... Uh, the major tourist attraction <laughs> yeah. in Chicago. And this was viewed sort of like Penn State is today, like a feeder, where, it was where a you feeder. come here for the it first two feeder. years, like a Correct. community college, and then go to exactly. Urbana for the exactly. junior or graduate. It, exactly. It was two years worth, and then... Um, Makes sense, And actually. then they were going to go to Urbana. And yeah, yeah it was yeah, basically yeah. a feeder. Yeah. Um, but people uh, didn't particularly want to go to Urbana. <laughs> And, and the, the, that feeder campus went from two years, and, and pretty soon it was a four-year school, and uh, in around 1965, I guess it was, uh, you know, Mayor Richard J. Daley was the mayor here. Right. And he had a very strong feeling about uh, the University of Illinois and how, how it was important to have it available to his people in Chicago. Okay. So he engineered, basically, to put uh, UI, the UICC, University of Illinois Chicago Circle Campus, here. Right. And basically, they moved from Navy Pier here in '65. Right, and big modern campus. Big modern campus. Lots of concrete. Lots, lots of, of concrete. Lots of people highways. And of course, that was the same year that the bioengineering training grants were approved. Oh, so yeah. there's a confluence. It of, was a confluence, yeah. absolutely. And uh, Larry Stark, who was an MD and was affiliated with Rush, apparently s built the bioengineering program here, right, with a training grant. Right. Um, yeah, Joel uh, Michael, who we 
interviewed uh, here previously, came to Rush at that time. Correct. And, and he said initially they all had their research labs over there, Correct. but then they had their teaching responsibilities Correct. here. Correct. Which is probably a good model. It was, <laughs> it was a good model. It was a good model. Anyway, UIC um, developed pretty well, actually, and uh, we were a, d a very decent school. Uh, and when, um, looking at his name now, the president of the university that actually did the merger, uh, Eikenberry. Eikenberry. Stanley Eikenberry, uh, who was very astute politically. Uh, and he, he knew that the legislature is ma largely made up of Chicago people, and the control legislature is Chicago. So he needed to have a bigger presence in Chicago than he had for the university. Right, if he wants state support. If he wanted state support. Right, so you have and to what offer he, something to the correct. constituents so of he the state the merger. in Chicago. Yep. He engineered the merger of, of what was UICC with the University of, Medi university yep. of Medical Center, yep. and, and UIC was born, and illegally in 1982. Uh, since then, UIC has grown very well, uh, and uh, and we've grown for a lot, number of reasons. One, we have we do have decent resources here. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we have the city, and we right. have right. <coughs> everything that the city offers. I, I know it's helped with recruiting in my, in my yeah. case and in other faculty we've hired. I'm thinking about. I, I don't have the numbers, but I know that there are a lot of faculty we have on this campus that were originally at Urbana because they wanted to come north. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, it is interesting. When I was uh, dean of the graduate college, my counterpart from Urbana, uh, I would see him at the opera here in Chicago. <laughs> and he would, be, he would drive up and then drive home again. Yep. And uh, he was, again, one of these guys that uh, liked the idea about coming to Chicago. And I'm sure he he a lot of faculty did as well, but they didn't want to go drive back at night. <laughs> they just yeah. Yeah, well, I was in Urbana then, and we, we tried to do some research here. Yeah. It's just a bridge a little too far distance-wise, 150 miles or Correct. so, and it's you can do it once in a while, but it's hard to come up in the morning, do an experiment, go back, and, 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 and to maintain that connection. Correct. Plus, we had no formal uh, arrangements of, for space or Correct. facilities, and, and there's always been a little bit of what should be done in one place should Correct. stay. And, and that's manifest even today with yeah. the thrust for a new medical school down there. I know. But just, just think about the big cities in the United States. You think about New York, Chicago, L.A., and you think about public universities yep. in, those, in, those, in those places. Um, L, you know, L.A. has UCLA yep. as a public yep. university, well, which is a world-class uh, university. San Diego has UCSD, which is pretty contemporary Pretty contemporary, UIC. right. Again, again, big city, public university. Right. New York City has the City University, which again right. is a major operation. And Chicago has UIC. Right. And there's no reason in the world why UIC shouldn't be thought of in the same category as U UCSD or UCLA. Right. Just a matter and of resources yeah. and growth. And right. And but the growth, the growth is urban growth. The growth is the city, and the city has huge resources. And um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very upbeat about the future of UIC in terms of uh, where it's going to be in 10 to 20 years. It's, it's, it's been steadily improving and steadily growing. And, uh, you know, it's, as far as I'm concerned, in many areas, it's already a world-class university. Well, I, the, this, after merging with the medical school, dental school, pharmacy, yeah. By any quantitative measure, it's a top 50 research exactly. institution exactly. In, in terms of grants, in terms of impact, Absolutely. publications. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. We've, we've, we, we also, I get, we were affiliated at one time with the CIC. Did you ever have yes. much to do with that? Uh, this is the what, Committee on Institutions? Committee on Institutions of Cooperation. Right. The, well, this was uh, an organization of the Big Ten plus the University of Chicago. Right. And, and UIC was led UIC in. was in there at one right. point, and then <clears throat> for, for political reasons, UIC was dropped out of that group. Yeah, I think recently when the Big Ten expanded <clears throat> to the Big 14, 16, right. whatever, uh, UIC got dropped by the wayside. Correct. Which is crazy, because they didn't drop U of C. You noticed that. I noticed that. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, but they've added Maryland, Rutgers, Nebraska. Correct. Who knows Correct. else? Correct. Everybody except Notre Dame. Yeah, my feeling about that is that in terms of the, the development of UIC, it doesn't matter. Right. I mean, UIC is perfectly capable of developing with the resources it has available on its own. They mm -hmm. don't, we don't need the CIC. And uh, I, 
I, I'm, I, I think UIC uh, will continue to grow and, and be, a, be a power. Good. All right. I, I, I've seen it grow in my time. You've seen it yeah. grow in yours, and there's no reason to expect that trajectory to, no. to change. What about bioengineering? Do you, do you see it maturing? Is it one of these uh, sigmoidal curves, ah. or is it a, a, a exponential? Well, the big buzzword, of course, is biotech. Everybody says biotech is, is a buzzword, and on and on and goes. What do you think bioengineering is? The thing is interesting about bioengineering as a discipline, as it has gotten bigger and bigger, it has also gotten smaller and smaller in a way. And that is its focus has, has gotten from the large machine down to the molecular level. Like, yeah. And uh, I believe the, the future of BioE is basically, basically at that level. I mean, basically, you know, the, the, the micro implants, the micro, the micro stuff. Nano robots. Nano robots right. and all right. that. And for the, uh, at least for, their, for the next decade or two, that's going to be a, a focus. Uh, but it's just so interesting how uh, BioE has has developed from basically uh, uh, radar machines, <laughs> right, 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 from biomedical <laughs> instrumentation, bio right. instrumentation, yeah. to, yeah. and uh, you know artificial kidneys and that yeah. kind of stuff. I, I used to call it the three P's: pumps, prosthetics, and pacemakers. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right to where it is now, and that is uh, is that uh, is. Talking about what engineering individual cells, and in, and right. and micro right. and right. micro. I mean, just this weekend they were talking about looking at which genes were turning on in the first mm -hmm. days of life. Uh, That's right. I mean, and to the extent that you can see these changes, the engineer in me and you thinks about well, when things go wrong, can we fix that? But that's what engineers do. Right. And when you start right. working on that level, I mean, you're yeah. really doing something right. amazing. But in some ways, aren't we in parallel following what biology has done? They've gone from a structural description of a whole organism or a leaf mm -hmm. to a functional description of its components, mm -hmm. ultimately to its molecular constituents and their genetic and, and networking control. Sure. I mean, they start talking more and more like engineers. But, but you know why that is true? Because they now have the instruments to, to, see, could, to see that. Right. And who develops those instruments? Physicists, <laughs> engineers. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, someone once asked me, I, I cocktail party every once in a while, I say I'm a biomedical engineer, and they say, what is that? And I answer the question with a question. Do you think docs understand the technology they use? And they said, oh. <laughs> so <laughs> there you are. Yep. I mean, that's yep. the, I mean, that's all the answer you need. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. Well, you know, as, as medicine has developed, it's become more and more technology dependent. And that's that's what bio and that's that's where bioengineers have such a such a major role to play. I worry, though, and, and some other faculty have expressed this concern that we uh, uh, perhaps are getting away from the technology and industrial base that we're following biophysics, molecular biology, sort of down the <coughs> down the uh, the path toward. Uh, uh, elucidating structure as opposed to developing devices that can be implanted and utilized? I think that's a false dichotomy here. Okay. I think... I'm thinking the, the, the emergence of things like tissue engineering, bioinformatics, mm -hmm. neural engineering, where, where the, it seems to me the balance sometimes gets switched from doing something useful and helpful with what we know today to elucidating where all the little fibers go in the white matter and how we might manipulate their sure. distribution. But if you can figure out where all the fibers go, then you th might and be able then to you can figure out why some of the fibers go in the wrong place. Then you might be able fix to it. fix it. Yeah. And that's what engineers do, they fix things. I, and that's, I, I mean, I try to make that point in, in my classes and in, <laughs> and in my research. Sure. Uh, but, but, but that's, that's the difference that I see between uh, engineering and science. Mm -hmm. Science, they're, they're, they're just as curious about the way things work, but they're perhaps not as quick to manipulate or control. Correct. Uh, they, they, they want to use that understanding to right. further the, the whole interconnectivity well, of life. Right. Whereas, you know, an engineer wants to make the pump or <clears throat> the kidney or the uh, implant work better. 
Well, well, the scientist is interested in finding out why something happens, and then once he figures out why it happens, he or she figures out why it happens, they're done. But an engineer wants to figure out why things happen, and then asks the next question, what happens when they don't happen the right way, right. and how do we fix it? And right. I think the engineer often tries to deal with it without complete understanding of the way all the molecular, genetic, <coughs> biochemical processes occur. But, of course, we always deal with incomplete information. I mean, that's, that's the nature of science, isn't it? Right. Yeah. But I, I think engineers often uh, build a model, sometimes a heuristic model, mm -hmm. that, that allows you to project uh, from what you know to other situations where you can apply that knowledge for useful purposes. Correct. I think the, the example I read of some books on was during World War II when they were designing propellers. Mm -hmm. that uh, by the end of the war, they could determine the pitch and the airfoil and the, th and the length of a propeller for any motor for any purpose mm -hmm. uh, within the flight em envelope of a, of a bomber or a fighter. And to this day, they still can't work out the actual uh, compressed f aerody aerodynamics at the tip of a spinning propeller at hundreds of RPM. But it doesn't matter. On a super it? But it doesn't matter because they have a formula Correct. that relates to things they can control in terms of the RPM and the pitch and the thrust Correct. to the to the performance. And and from a medical perspective, that's what I hear in in my case of my work with MRI over and over again. That well, that's a nice theory. That's a nice uh, you know elegant description of what's going on. But but what biomarker can I, with high reliability, identify from an image quickly that will tell me something new about this condition? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, engineers, um, you, know, the, you know, the famous story about, about solving a problem without figuring out the theory goes back to Willem Kalf with the first artificial kidney. You know that story? No. Second World War, uh, Willem Kalf was a urologist. And he was having patients, Dutch patients, who were dying of, uh, of kidney failure. And what he did, he rigged up a barrel and a tub filled with salt water and a, and a length of sausage casing. And he wrapped the sausage casing around the barrel. And he, and he, and he, he basically, he, he uh, built allowed... Built a dialysis system? Huh? Building a dialysis he system? He built a dialysis system. Oh my gosh! He built it, and he did this during, un, and basically what he did, he reversed the uh, the, the signs of uh, uremia when he he allowed the patient's blood to flow through the sausage casing, and he bathed it in salt water, and allowed the poisons to to migrate through the sausage casing and into, into the bath, yeah. and uh, that was the first artificial kidney. And he did this under German occupation during the Second World War. And there was there was one case. This is one case in Holland where the uh, where the Dutch citizens were 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 better off than the German occupiers. Oh my gosh! I not heard that story. Yeah, and and Kalf wound up uh, eventually going, uh, uh, migrating and went to the University of Utah, and he spent the rest of his career right, right, at, at right, Utah. Right. Basically, and to this day, artificial organs as a are, bioengineer are, are a big uh, strength of that program. And it, Kalf started it. Wow. So, uh, and but you know, he may have been a urologist, but he was really an engineer. Yeah, I teach bioinstrumentation, and I, I once <clears throat> tried to make the analysis that, uh, or the correspondence between great engineering advances and medical applications. You know, the, mm -hmm. the traditional physics in in the Rentkin sense, physics discovers X-rays. It's quickly applied as as a mm -hmm. medical technology. I figure, well, th there must be situations with dialysis with uh, uh, implantable mm -hmm. uh, uh, pacemakers with with other devices, right. where the engineer has discovered this and then the doctors applied it. But but in fact, it was flipped. When I went back and looked at it, al almost every case it was the surgeon, the urologist, or the or, or the neurologist who uh, saw the problem, tried some crude attempt at solving the problem, and then got the engineering involved to make that work better. You know the history of uh, artificial eye lenses, where that where that where it came from, where, where finally people figured out that you could actually uh, re replace the lens in the eye with with a plastic lens and, and have it work. Second World War again, pilots when they were getting shot at, a lot of them wound up with with shards of glass in their eyes, and there was never an allergic reaction to anything that wound up in their eyes. So the observation the observation <coughs> was that, you could that, do that, it, that, right. that the eyes the eyes right. will not. 
they're develop a, an allergic reaction to anything. They're an immune sort and of And all of a sudden, isolated now we have people who have cataract surgery, takes 10 minutes, and you get, you get an artificial lens, and your eyes do not react to that. Interesting. And that was, that was an observation, okay. again, mm -hmm. out of the Second World War. So. so do you think these examples will and opportunities will continue to of propagate into the future? Then? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it is in our interest to figure out ways of helping us live longer and live better. And these observations will indeed uh, propagate into the future, and bioengineers will have a large role to play in that. I, 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 it certainly has been my experience so far, as I live longer and hope to live <laughs> better, uh, I'm, I'm all for them uh, fixing things yeah, uh, right. and, and so that we can, we can go on with this. And, and I think it also, um, it, it, it's a good message to have for the students uh, who are entering bioengineering to mm -hmm. know that this isn't a field that's plateauing, it's not a, a backwater that's going to just uh, <clears throat> establish certain methods and stick to them. I, I think uh, th there's going to be an, a widening sort of biological uh, solution to problems as mm -hmm. opposed to electrical or material or, mm -hmm. or chemical that will think of ways to use or engineer cells so that they can supply mm -hmm. what's missing. Yes. And not, not so much just a, a piece of plastic or a piece of glass. <laughs> right, right. Amen well, to that. Well, it's been very uh, um, interesting talking to you. Uh, hearing about your experiences here at UIC and, uh, and, and talking with you about uh, where things might be going someday. Ah, uh, I wanted to uh, give you a, a, a small token, uh, something to think about us when you wake up in the morning and something that you, can, that you can wear under your hat. You have, oh, to get, you have to get the shirt to match the right hat if you have well, a bioengineering. I, I have a bioengineering hat. Now you have, I will wear the shirt. Now you have a bioengineering shirt to, to go with the hat. Well, thank you. And, and I, I, I want to also in, invite you to come to attend our 50th uh, uh, <coughs> anniversary symposium this I'd, November. I'd and, love to. And uh, just uh, make it uh, abundantly clear that you're, you're welcome uh, anytime, your, your input. I, I know you've been very good about sharing your files and, and mm -hmm. some of your uh, uh, historical record with the library. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we, we, we need to know about the past if we're going to yeah. use it to help move forward into a... Well, it, it was great fun for me to be involved in bioengineering early on and through its development. And uh, I wish you the best of luck well, in continuing. Thank you very much. It's been My a pleasure. Wonderful.